Ciao everyone, today I'm going to show you how I mix drums and I'm going to do this by showing you some of my favorite Waves plugins. I'm going to show you how to elevate the sound of your drums from going from a very rough stage like this one to the finish line of having record ready drums. Full disclaimer, for this tutorial, I'm not gonna be using any sound reinforcement nor drum replacement softwares. The only thing I'm gonna be using is Waves plugins. And if you're interested in what I'm using, hit the links down below where you can access all the plugins that I'm using for this video. Without any further ado, let's get into it. All right, now that we're on this session, I'm gonna give you a sneak peek on how the drums used to sound when they got delivered to me. And after. Okay, so from what you can hear, the drums, the original version, or the, actually the raw version, sounded very boxy. There are a lot of areas of confusion, a lot of problematic areas that have to do with face canceling and comb filtering. So here's what I generally do. As you can see, all my drums have been routed to a master submix for my drums. And I'm gonna go step by step showing you exactly what I use each step in the line when I'm mixing drums. So first and foremost, every time I get drums, even before I get down to mixing them, the first stage of it is for me to check their phase. As a matter of fact, over here, as you can see, especially on my overhead rooms and trash, I call it trash because it sounds like trash, the trash uh, microphone tracks, those are all ambience microphones. That means that they have been placed with a certain distance compared to the proximity microphone. So if not a lot of care has been taken during the recording with measuring exactly their distance, I know for a fact that I'm going to run in some problems where some of the hits of the snare drums especially will be masked due to the time delay upon which the sound will travel from the closed microphone or proximity microphone up to the actual ambience microphone. So I'm going to give you a little sneak peek of how this element sounded. And as you can see here, I've already made a few playlists. This is because generally when it comes to phase alignment, there's no better plugin than waves in phase. Now, in this case, this is a great plugin because what it allows me to do is actually taking a sample of the actual sound. And as you can see here, I'm working with two discrete channels, in this case, an alpha and a beta or an alpha and a sidechain. And I can actually see what is the time delay between the two waves and figured out any discrepancies by, of course, as you can see here, working in making sure that the signals are as aligned as possible. In other words, what I want and what I'm looking for is for both signals, when the snare hits and the overheads and room microphone hits, I want the speaker to all respond seamlessly to what is happening. So I want the speaker to move forward and backward at unison. I don't want the snare drum creating a compression and at the same time I have a overhead or a room creating a rarefactions. So waves in phase helps me with this. And right now what I did, uh, especially with the overheads and rooms, I have already uh, rendered this process. And the way it works is that you could use a send, which I've, I've called in phase, which sends the signal through the side chain of in phase. You can measure the difference between the two and start playing with the gain between left and right if you're working with a stereo signal, as well as readjusting the phase so that the correlation is as blue or in phase as possible. Now, just to give you a little sneak peek of it, I'm gonna solo the rooms and the snare drum, and I'm gonna go to the very first uh, playlist I had. 
focus on how the snare drum is all smeared out. It's not very focused. So this is with in phase off. and phase on. Off. On. So as you can hear right now, what we're doing between the rooms and as well the overheads, I'm gonna let you hear them too. So this is overheads before in phase. in phase if you focus on the sound of the snare drum right now a we have readjust the time delay between the left and the right microphone as well as made sure that when the snare hits the burst of sounds that leaves the snare drum and reaches the overhead microphone has the exact same time compensated between the direct microphone and the overhead's microphone. And in phase is pretty much is on 99.9% .9 of my mixes every time I work with organic music because I want to make sure again that the phase response and correlation is absolutely perfect even before I get to mix. And I can assure you that if you're gonna be using this plugin 99% of times by just adjusting and working with phase, you have solved many of the problems that you would spend hours and days trying to figure it out with an EQ, which where in fact you cannot. So solving this issue, right now we have overhead, we have room, and as well the trash microphone. you can figure it out why I call it trash. Now, I wanna let you hear the trash microphone plus the closed microphone, the snare closed microphone. Listen before in phase is applied. You hear that there is a slightly of a delay between when the closed microphone hits and then the trash or roomier hyper-compressed microphone hits. I'm gonna let you hear once again without and with. You hear how all of a sudden the, the, the this microphone which shall be used as a sort of like parallel hyper compressed version of the entire drum kit just start resonating a lot with the sound of the snare drum. So after I made sure that every single channel of mine it's in phase, I just move on into tailoring and shaping the envelope of my instrument. Now the first plugging in the chain is the Waves NLS. And as you can see right now, I've used a series of Waves NLS. If you're curious to understand how nonlinear summing works, I have left a link down in the description where I cover in very details how Waves NLS works. Now, the concept of NLS is introducing a bit of nonlinearity between one signal and another. And as you can see here, if I pull up the very first three instances of NLS, from my kick drum to my sub to my snare drum. As you can see, all three instances, A, are three different channels, as a matter of fact, over here, per console. So we have an SSL, we have an EMI 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Mark II, and a Neve. Waves have modeled 32 different channels. So right now, right out of the bath, you see that I'm working already with a different sort of 
analog circuitry. On top of that, I have modified the drive section. So by changing the input level, I can add or subtract different types of harmonic components. Now, the only different thing is that whereas the entire drum kit is being passing through the Neve circuitry, the actual trash microphone, it's going through an NLS EMI 12345 Mark II because I love the type of harmonic saturation this channel add. And before I play the entire drums with it, I want to let you hear only the thrash microphone with the NLS EMI. You feel how much grit and explosiveness we get out of the signal? So I could not achieve this with the Neve nor with the SSL, which is very mid-range driven. And right now I have the ability not only of choosing a different channel, again, from 1 until 32, with subtle differences between one channel and another, but I can even change the console. So I'm mixing the entire drum through an SSL and only one of this microphone is going through an EMI. But enough of me talking, I'm going to let you hear now the drums before, without, and then with the NLS engaged. I mean, night and day. Now we have gained back all the grit, all the punch from the sound of the drums actually passing through the circuitry of the Neve and kind of like rounding off a bit of the low end, making it bulkier in a way. Second stop for me is the true tone shaper for my drums, which lies in the SSL channel strip. Now Waves made a phenomenal job in emulating this brand new SSL 4000E channel. And as a matter of fact, right now, this channel is on all my tracks. I got the nonlinearity from NLS. And now right now I can only worry about how to apply this incredible channel strip in order to reshape the real tone of my drums. Now I'm going to start with the kick drums just to let you hear what can you do with this channel. So this is the kick drum without and without the SSL. With. I mean, right out of the bath, two different kick drums, completely different. The thing I love, I love to do the most with these EQs, especially if we check even the snare drum over here. So let's get on the snare first. It's just really hyper stressing and working these plugins out. Because that's how, you know, you can get a lot of the grainy analog sound out of them. So as you can see, especially on my snare and kick drum, I'm kind of like abusing the high and high mids quite a lot. So my kick drum and snare all lies in their upper harmonic around 8K. For my kick drum, I'm boosting around 2K. And for my snare drum, I'm very close to 2K. I'm removing a lot of the between 300 and 700. And on my kick, I'm actually using a different type of EQ, the brown EQ, which is known to give a bit more non-linearity and a little more uncontrolled hump to the low end. Whereas on my snare drum, I'm actually boosting a bit or quite a lot of 200 Hertz. Now, the thing I love the most about this plugins are a couple of features. A, we have a microphone input section which I can actually use to drive in the signal a bit more before it hits the channel. Second of all, it's this icon over here. Now, this is great because, in fact, it will, by engaging this icon, 
I can actually hear to the frequency knob, which is massive. It's an incredible tool, which allows you not only to kind of like spot the annoying frequency or enhance the frequency that you need by ear, but if you are uncertain about something, you can isolate the frequency and actually have a proper swipe, a unity level of what exactly you are highlighting. As you can see over here, in a lot of my mixes, what I generally do is use the EQ pre-compressor. Especially when I'm boosting this much, I tend to have the compressor right after to kind of like tame down a lot of the peaks that I would otherwise get. Check it out on the kick drum, for instance. This is without the EQ. This is with the channel strip and EQ back. If I put the EQ after the compressor, I have this sometimes wanted or sometimes unwanted dynamic where we have that tunk, 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 tunk. The loudest part of the kick drum is kind of like an even the overall performance. So what I'm trying to do here is to keep my kick drum a bit more even, having the compressor taking down of the clickety part of the kick drum a bit more. So again, without or actually EQ after compression, before compression. You hear how more controlled everything is? Moving forward to two other elements of this drums, the toms. So I'm gonna let you hear the sound of the toms first without anything. With NLS. Okay, we recovered a bit of the low end, but we could do a bit better. So on my toms, I'm using again, two instances of the SSL channel strip. As you can see, they are very similar. So what I'm doing here, it's using a lot of the high end in order to imprint a lot of the attack. Both of the channel strip are set, especially when I'm boosting this much high end, to have the EQ before the compressor, for the reason I explained before. I'm using a tiny bit of the gate to just tame down that low end rumble. And then the only thing that actually differentiate the rack tom from the floor tom is the actual fundamental low frequency. So whereas on the rack tom, I am enhancing a bit more of the 120 hertz, on the actual floor tom, I'm enhancing a bit more of the 60. So I'm gonna let you hear the two toms before without the channel strips and then with. Again, without, with. You hear how much attack we're actually carrying out. And if I have to let you hear what is that the 50 or 60 are doing. So this is on the rack tom. And this is on the floor tom. And the little click that you hear is the actual gate opening. So I'm using the gate as well, especially on the SSL channel strip, as a sort of like tone shaper and transient designer so that I can get a lot of the attack out of it. So what I'm going to do right now is actually playing you the entire drum kit without the SSL and then with the SSL.
So right now, as you can hear, the drums has acquired a whole different types of shape. It's a bit more aggressive. It's way more focused, giving space to closed microphones versus ambience microphone. And at this point that I have re-actually shaped the sound of my drums, what I'm going to do, it's time for sound designing it a bit more. So in order to sound design, I have taken a couple of different approaches. First of all, starting from my room microphone, I'm going to let you hear a bit what the SSL channels are still doing. So the room microphones are generally very, 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 very muddy. So the problem with the room microphones is that if I open up the closed miking of my snare and kick drum, there is a lot of clashing. There's a lot of masking that happens due to the fact that the kick drum and the entire room are sharing more or less the exact same space, but the room microphone is just a bit more out of control sometimes. With the SSL channel on the rooms. You hear how actually more tailored the rooms is right now on top of the closed microphones. I'm gonna let you hear again without first. In. It's just bouncing along. You know, we have the closed microphone giving us a lot of the impact and the room just being designed as a room, as a kind of like flavor. I'm gonna actually solo up only the room to let you hear what is that we did. Again, without. And with. So what we did was carving space for our closed microphone to work together. We have burst a bit of the 8K, actually 7K, just to enhance a bit more the snap of the snare drum. We have removed a lot of this very harsh frequency. We have removed a ton of 300, 400. this very honky sound. And as well as we have added just a tiny bit of 56 Hertz. Just to allow the low end of the kick drum to be extended a bit more. But what would actually made magic here was the input level, the microphone input level where we added a bit more saturation. Again, I'm gonna replay the snare and kick drum with the room microphone without the SSL style EQ and then with. You hear how more controlled everything is. And the same thing goes for our overhead. So if I would open up the overheads here, I'm gonna let you hear the overheads without anything. Which are not necessarily bad if they played by themselves. But once you start adding closed miking, that's where the problem arise. We have a lot of, of the good frequencies that we have in fact highlighted on the snare itself and on the kick drum itself that are gonna end it up competing with what the overheads are doing. So that's why I've mixed it in a way that I use the SSL for coloration and tone shaping, making sure that the overheads are as wide as possible, as airy as possible, allowing a maximum displacement in the stereo spread, but still leaving enough space for my direct microphone, so kick and snare to actually come through. 
So I'm going to let you hear it before. And after. Once again, focus on the high end, the close miking versus the space they were gaining without and then with. You have all that built up when this EQ is not engaged around the 200 hertz, which make the snare almost unperceivable. Now, something I love about this plugin also is that when you place the SSL channel strip on a stereo track, you have actually have access to adopt something that they call the extra wide feature. That means that you're going to take this, this stereo source and kind of like place it a little bit wider so it will remove just a tiny bit of the middle content allowing a maximum displacement from left to right. So just to recap what we did so far, before SSL, after. So as I was telling you, couple seconds ago, now is the time that I generally take to tailor a bit more the sound design instinct that it's in me. And I'm going to start first with my kick drum, actually with my toms. So my toms in this case, which play in uh, quite a lot of parts in this performance, sound like this. which is still a very good sound, but I think I could add a bit more. So on top of the sound that I crafted with the SSL right now, I'm using also another kind of brand new plugin that Waves did. This plugin is called Smack Attack. Now the beauty of Smack Attack is that it's a transient designer, but an incredible tone shaper as a matter of fact, via this plugin, I can hyper accentuate the actual attack based on very steep to a more morbid attack. I can tailor the sustain. What does that mean? That I can make things sticking out more if I want, working with their envelope, increasing the sustain or decreasing the sustain to kind of like, as I did here on the floor tom, I kind of like redesign the decay or the natural decay of the tom. So if I have to play you this before, without, and then with Smack Attack. Again, feel how much more control we have about the stomps. Now it's less about rumbly and kind of like a frequency chaos but it's something way more controlled. And as a matter of fact, we're adding all that extra snap that was a little bit lacking from the tom after we have EQ them and compressed them. And on one of them, we have prolonged the decay just a tiny bit ever so slightly versus the other one where the floor tom had a lot of ringing going on, like <laughs> these weird notes. So what we did was removing it, but but about taming down a bit of the sustain. With. See, instead of being very wobbly, we have a much more crafted decay. The same thing or the same way as I apply smack attack on my toms gets actually applied on my kick drum and snare drum. So here in my kick and snare, I have used smack attack in order again to imprint even more snap to these very important elements of my drum kit. And I have tailored it so that we have quite a lot of uh, attack on both of them 
just a tiny bit ever so slightly of decay. So here is without and then with. You hear how all of a sudden both of these instruments just acquire a bit more present within what we're doing. So I'm using a transient designer to actually hyper accentuate what the instruments are doing. And here to a funny one, I'm actually using a transient designer even on my room tracks, but in a completely different way. So especially on this stereo room microphones, the first thing I want to do is to kind of create a very bombastic sound out of this room microphone. So for this, of course, I'm using the trusty CLA-76, which is a copy of the Ure-1176. Now, in this case, I have my ratio at four, very fast release, kind of, kind of medium to slow attack. And I'm using this compressor primarily because after I have tailored the sound of the rooms, which sounds like this, Right now, what I want to do is get this very precise and concise sound of our rooms and make it just a tiny bit forward, right? So that we hear this bombasticness sound bouncing around the room. So here's without and then with. So you hear how all of a sudden the kick drum and the snare started to become a bit more prominent in this room, which is really nice because through this microphone, I'm actually going to be tailoring a bit more the sustain of these two instruments. So after this is when I actually use Smack Attack. So first I designed the sound of the room, and then as I did for the other instruments, I use Smack Attack. But in this case, I'm actually doing the opposite. So I am decreasing the attack and increasing the sustain so that when I'm listening to it, this room sounds way bigger and deeper than actually it is. So I'm gonna let you hear the room before without smack attack and then with. Focus on the kick drum. So with the 1176, now kick and snare just moved forward. And right now I just wanna carve a little hole to allow the close microphone to stick out a bit more, right? And this is why I'm using this Transcend Shaper Designer. So by reducing the attack and actually augmenting the sustain, I'm kind of like bringing back the umph of the kick drum and the snare. So instead of hearing tuku, we hear if that makes any sense. Should kind of. Moving along the line, we have our trusty parallel recorded trashy microphone. Now, the trash microphone is a great way in order to imprint a lot of depth and grit to the sound because you will blend in the sounds to taste, but it adds some problems. And the problems that it adds is that it will smear the entire picture of the drums. In other words, all the elements that you have recorded are going to be kind of lost. The snare drum is going to start getting hidden. The kick drum is overpowering. Um, so here's what I generally do. First, I'm going to let you hear the trash microphone. I'm gonna let you hear this without the SSL first. With. So what we did was just simply polishing it a bit, removing a bit of um, 8K, sorry, a little bit of the 700, a bit of 300, and just adding just a tiny bit more of three, of uh, between two and 300. After this, I have placed a C1 gate, which is a phenomenal tool if you're aiming to really 
clean up the sound and leaving it very natural. Now, the way I work with this is in a very specific way. So first, I'm going to let you hear the trash microphone without the gate, but with the snare drum. So as you can hear right now, the problem is that the snare drum is kind of like trying to compete to find its own place within the Strash microphone. Snare alone. Actually, I'm going to place kick and snare alone. With the thrash microphone. You hear that there is this boom, 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 this kind of like uh, basketball bouncing back between the kick and snare and the trash microphone. So what I did over here was from my snare drum, I actually have created a side chain, a bus, which will control when the actual gate will open up and close based on the sound of the snare drum. So they were going to go from something very sparse and kind of like out of control, like in this case. from having the trash microphone track opening only when the snare hits to produce a much more impactful sustain for the snare drum, but still having kick and snare very under control. So this is without. And this is with. You hear how right now we're using this gate to tailor a bit more and to decide the length of the snare drum. Almost like if we're using a sample, but in fact we're not. So I'm going to let you hear again without and then with. See, right now we're preserving a lot of the direct kick. And in this case, the trash microphone used in a side chain just allows the snare to breathe a bit more. Just add this extra layer of length that it was missing before. And then still in the trash microphone, what it did was actually adding a ton of smack attack. Because I wanted the length of the snare to really poke through and just steam it down just ever so slightly it sustained. So we're going to go from something that sounds like this to this. Do you hear how much right now the snare has actually gained extra depth from it? It's like if we're adding a very short, extremely dense reverb to it. If I would play this in context. Without the thrash microphone. With. I'm going to play the exact same example in context. Before without and then with. You hear all of a sudden the just the snare drum became just bigger. Then still in the realm of sound designing my drums, I absolutely love what my friends at Waves did with this plugin. This plugin is called Torque. And it's pretty much a pitch shifter on steroids. Like it's one of the most natural and organic, as they write over here, resynthesis device ever. And I generally used to carve out some of the missed octaves and tone that sometimes I don't get from instruments in the way they have been recorded. To give you an example, once again, my trusty tom sounds something like this. Mm -hmm. 
which is already pretty good if you consider it. Also, we don't have a lot of that decay because the decay is actually added from the room and the overhead's microphone, right? So don't worry about that. What I'm more concerned here is the actual timbre of the stomps. So I'm using torque right now to reshape them and kind of like pitching it down there of about 322 cents, 320 cents, sorry, and 550 cents, the floor tom. And listen now, we're going from literally amateur toms to professional recorded hit record toms. It's just a completely redesign. It's just, we're not using samples. We're just playing with the actual spectrum of that sound and just dialing in the amount of percentage we want to retune in this specific instance are toms. Now I did a similar thing with my snare drum here. It was just a tiny bit too high. So I used torque in order to resample it down a tiny bit. It's very saddled, but you could hear that the tone of the snare got a bit darker, which is, and fuller if you may, which is something that I love. So just to recap where we at right now, I'm gonna let you hear the entire drum kit without what we have, and then with. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. Actually, I was kidding. It will get even better than this. All right, so right now I got to the point that I think I can start thinking a bit more about the space that I wanna carve around my drums. I've set a specific amount of sends only for my overhead and ambience microphone and just a tiny bit on my snare drum and these buses are actually sending to an aux that I call room. On this aux I actually have a CLA Epic. So what I have over here it's a room number five and the only thing I did was tweaking the presets was just lowering just a tiny bit the reverb time. So I'm gonna let you hear this with and without this reverb. So this is without. With. You hear like by inputting within the reverb only the space, we are inputting the space into a space and add a bit of sizzle, if we may, via the direct send that is placed on the snare drum. But the, a lot of the sound of this room comes from the actual rooms that we're sending in it. And it's a very musical reverb. I'm gonna let you hear once again without and with. Listen how much the size, especially stereo spread of the elements just start taking place into this much larger room. It's just crazy. And with this reverb, you can go as wild as you want as it has the addition to have different flavors of delay and as well different types of reverbs within one plugin. 
Now, one thing I notice is that this is a moment where I'm starting after adding this very first effect, I'm starting to lack a bit of presence coming from my kick and snare. So the moment I added this room reverb, everything sounds a bit more cohesive, but somehow that kind of like hyper artificial built that we create while mixing was kind of lost. So I have created another sets of bus only for my kick in and my snare drum, which are going to an aux called KS, kick and snare. This is generally a mono aux that I use to augment the presence of mono program material, in this case, kick and snare. On this aux, I have one of the best linear EQ that I've ever used so far, which is the Waves R EQ, and my trusty DBX 160. So what I did with this EQ was actually taming down a bit of the lows. I put a high pass filter 148 hertz. I have actually removed a bit of that sizzle from the snare drum, placing um, another bell filter at approximately 11,000 hertz, and I've taken a lot of 1,200 hertz, the honky frequency. After removing what I didn't want from kick and snare, that's the moment where I used the DBX160 to actually bring in a lot of the pumpiness from these two instruments. So I'm gonna let you hear before without, and then I will add the parallel kick and snare compression. So it's an ever so slightly different, which in this case, put a bit more in the forefront, kick and snare, making sure that every time they hit, they are absolutely at the center of the attention of our mix. Now, this is a moment that I think we have addressed a lot of these elements in a more micro analysis point of view. This is the point that I would generally go on my drum aux and start thinking a bit more macro. So how does the overall sound of my drum kit actually sounds all together? Because we have to remember when we're mixing drums, we have to keep in mind that the drums shall be mixed as a whole, not as a separate instrument. So it's just a beautiful ensemble that belongs to this incredible percussion flavor. But we have to remember that the picture that we need to have needs to be taken in a sort of like eye bird view. So making sure that all the part of this beautiful puzzle work together. So all my drums, as I said, are redirected to my drum bus. Now my drum bus has currently four plugins in it. I'm gonna start with the first one. This is a pull textile EQ. And what I did was carving and adding a bit of 60 Hertz with a little attenuation, so to create that famous resonant filter that only the Pultec EQ can do. And then again, I did the same thing around 12K. Listen to how much all of a sudden, when I engage this EQ, the entire drum kit glues together, and now we have these two extremes where we have a hyper accentuation of the, 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 the kick hit, uh, the snare um, crack, and at the bottom end, we have a lot of roundness coming from this very gentle and musical 60 hertz filter. So this is without the entire drum kit and then with. So especially even when the toms come in, you hear how this EQ is capable of getting a much broader, you know, spectral action. So it's not just a simple EQ, it's a musical instrument. So as I'm boosting and attenuating and creating my resonant filters, the second plugin I generally use on my drum bus, it's a Fairchild style compressor, is a 670. Now in this case, the most important thing that I always recommend you doing, especially when working on a mix bus, or in this case, a, a stem bus, is to make sure 
the left and right side of your compressors are unlinked. Because what this will do is allowing the left and right to work independently. So if the hypothesis, like in this case, we have a tom fill happening, if the right part of the compressor needs to compress just a tiny bit more to keep that floor tom under control, the left side won't be feeling this compression and will still work with the left portions of the program material that is feeding this compressor. So as you're gonna see, this compressor is doing minimal compression. I'm primarily using this primarily for texture and I'm using on this specific instance a time constant of three. So I'm gonna play it before without and then with. I mean, focus on the kick and sneer. When this compressor is on, all of a sudden, just these two elements are just round, fat, beautiful, and big. And they sound extremely musical in context of the rest of the drums. So this compressor is working in an upward and downward way, so to balance the entire spectrum of the song. Another plugin I absolutely love is the J37, which is a tape machine. I generally use this uh, with the formula of 888 15 IPS, which I think works phenomenally on low end content, especially drums. And I'm driving the level into the tape just ever so slightly so that I can kind of like tame down a bit of the extra snappiness from the, the actual snare drum. So I'm gonna let you hear without and with. Focus on what happened to the snare. Again, I'm gonna let you hear before. After. It's kind of like this tape machine is rounding everything, making the drum sounds as if, in fact, they have been recorded through tape, allowing me to tame down the ugly part and unforgiving part of the digital domain and bringing back all that analog texture, which otherwise would have been lost forever. And last, it's a cherry on top of cake. I think after this, Waves have just created the perfect plugin. This is the BB Tubes, which I didn't go too much into it within this mix. I've just played a little bit with Beauty, which adds an even amount of harmonics, and the Beast, which adds an odd amount of harmonics. And I've just placed the sensitivity ever so slightly so that we can get this very punchy tone out of our drums without even distorting that too much. So this is the BB Tubes, which is a brand new plugin that my friends at Waves have recently released. Listen, the difference that is going to make on the drum bus. It's just mind blowing. The way this plugin is working and the transformer they have modeled within it, it's just incredible and it's super musical. So what I'm gonna do right now is just playing you the drums without mix bus processing and then with. night and day. I mean, it's just, as I hope you saw, it's just a little by little, working at a micro level, working at the micro level, and working at the micro level. The name of the game is keep in mind that the whole drum kit, it's important. And last but not the least, this is a drum 
mixing tutorial. We could have not do this without using a bit of parallel processing. As a matter of fact, right now, in order to kind of like add a bit more of average part of the signal, what I did was sending my entire drum kit, and as you can see, all my sends are replicating the exact same panning information and fader information of my big fader, sending the entire drum mix into my parallel drums, which has been already blended to taste. And what this parallel track has are two plugins. Of course, it has a linear REQ4 and an H compressor. Now, I love this compressor primarily because of one specific feature. A, it's very musical, but B, it has the punch knob, which is sort of like adding an extra layer of compression on top of, perhaps like in this case, a very abused compressor. So I'm gonna let you hear the drum kit, first without parallel compression, and then with. And I mean, if I want, I can drive this a bit louder for you to hear. But before I do so, all right. Of course, right now it's a little bit too much. So what I'm gonna do is removing everything that I just did. So with this parallel processing right now, we have actually gained back a bit more of depth that otherwise would have been gone. And just to recap everything that we have done right now, this is where we started. And this is our final product. And this is it. So this is how I use some of my favorite Waves plugins to mix drums. Now, if you're interested in experimenting a bit more, I have left all the links down in the description from where you can access every single plugin that I've used for these tutorials. Now, if you have enjoyed the content of this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And until the next time, ciao.